I ever leave this world alive I'll come back down and sit beside your feet tonight Wherever I am, you'll always be More than just a memory Well, if I ever leave this world alive Hey folks, Professor Finn here, and this popped up on my radar, and I was like, oh yeah, Oh, yeah, we're going to talk about this. So um, the article we're about to read comes from CNET.com, and I've used CNET for years for technology reviews and things like that. But apparently they're going into, or probably their parent company, is going into some uh, quasi-journalistic uh, sort of business model. So let's take a read here. And I'm going to try not to be snarky, uh, but I definitely have a bias and there are some glaring problems I have with this. So let's talk about this. Uh, funerals are expensive, broken, and exploitive. They have to change. The median cost of a funeral is $7,360, and most in the U.S. can't afford it. This is by Nicole Archer. This was written uh, basically two days ago, May 25th, 2020. Today is May 27th. If we click on her name to see a little bit about her, uh, a social media producer based in Sydney, Australia. She has a background in history. She's happy to talk about the Great Fire of London at length. We're not writing about video games, the internet, or television. She's probably looking at cool rocks. Um, so, okay, cool. Not a... Um, not generally a social commentary media pundit sort of thing, but okay. So let's read. My grandfather passed away in a windy April afternoon in 2017. He died in his home in Ulladulla, Australia. And if I butcher the names of cities, um, I apologize. I am not familiar with any of these cities or these pronunciations. Uh, with my mum and uncle beside him looking out at the gum trees. Afterwards, mum sat with his body in the cool room before calling the local funeral home to come pick him up. Later, the family got together to reminisce about his love for whiskey and milk, we call it poppy cocktail, and his habit of talking loudly about people we didn't know while we were all watching television. My grandfather had what some would call a good death. That isn't to say the cause of his death was good. The mesothelioma that took his life was swift and brutal, uh, but he had the agency to talk about what he wanted, and importantly, we were lucky enough to have the resources and give it to him. So he had the good death and the home he built listening to the birds. The good death. Not everyone is privileged enough to get a good death. End-of-life care can be financially and emotionally taxing, and providing the elderly the death they desire can be nearly impossible for many families. Seven out of ten Americans want to die at home according to the Kaiser Family Foundation. Only four of ten believe they will. Some believe we will need to calibrate our relationship with death from the ground up. And a uh, quote from Sarah Chavez, we are a youth-centric society. I think a very large part of that is because of our fear of death. Uh, and Sarah Chavez is one of the founders of the Death Positive Movement and the executive director of the Order of the Good Death, a community of industry professionals, academics, and artists advocating for a healthier relationship with death. At the core of our relationship with death and dying, Chavez says, it is our obsession with youth. We're a youth-centric society, and I think a very large part of that is because of our fear of death. The U.S. is the largest anti-aging market in the world, spending millions of dollars in anti-wrinkle cream, hair dye, and cosmetic products. We hide away our elderly in nursing homes and hospitals to prolong their lives out of sight. They remind us of our mortality. Our elders are not... Uh, just not out and about everywhere, you don't see people age. A broken system. According to the National Funeral Directors Association, the median cost of a funeral with viewing and burial is $7,360. For a burial with a cement vault, as required by most cemeteries, notes the NFDA, the cost jumps to around $8,700. Funeral homes are businesses. This is a multi-billion dollar industry, and while the majority of funeral homes are privately owned, there is a surprising lack of competition. Service Corporation International is the largest public death care company in the United States with over 1,900 locations in North America and revenue in 2018 of $3.19 billion. The next, uh, next largest company, Stonemore Partners, made a fraction of that, $316 million. 
uh, Service Corporation International didn't respond to requests for comment. A large part of the business model for these companies involves buying up small funeral homes, trusted family-run businesses, and used by the community for generations. They keep the name and inject the salespeople and astronomical costs. You want a private viewing to say goodbye? That'll be $725 for embalming, $250 for cosmetics, $425 for the use of the space, uh, space and staff. That's over $1,000 before the funeral even starts. I just got an email from a woman, an older woman today, and she said that she buried her husband. The funeral home told her that it was a law that she had to bury concrete to buy concrete to put over the casket, Chavez says. It's a lie. And you hear these lies a lot. That's not a law at all. In any way, shape, or form, concrete blocks are not only profitable, uh, but they uh, make it easy to keep everything uniform so the lawn maintenance can be done around them. So why do cemeteries charge people for things under the guise of law? Because cemeteries are, by and large, private properties. So they can essentially make their own rules. Of course, they're going to choose what is most profitable for them, Chavez explains. Upsells like concrete vaults and embalming are so common they're seen as requirements, and few are in the position to question it. Many funeral homes require bodies to be embalmed before viewing, and morticians are often taught at mortuary school it's a necessity. The truth is, embalming isn't required at all. No state law requires every body to be embalmed, and most of the time, refrigeration is enough to keep a body in good condition until burial. There's a common belief that embalming is necessary for sanitizing the body and making it safe to be around, but corpses pose no real threat to public health. The pathogens that decompose bodies aren't dangerous, nor is the smell of advanced decay. While corpses aren't dangerous, there's mounting proof embalming fluid is. The main chemical in embalming fluid is formaldehyde, which is incredibly toxic. Since the 1980s, studies have shown morticians are at greater risk for several types of cancer because of their exposure to embalming fluid. Once bodies decompose, the embalming fluid seeps into the dirt, potentially contaminating the ground. But uh, the bigger danger to most Americans isn't the risk associated with embalming fluid. It's the risk that a funeral could bankrupt them entirely. Most Americans aren't in the financial position to afford a funeral in the first place. A study by the Federal Reserve in 2018 found that 61% of American adults could uh, afford an unexpected expense of $400, while a whopping 39% would not be able to afford it without having to sell possessions or go without food or other necessities. For most people, an unexpected $8,000 funeral bill would be emotionally and financially devastating. To bury someone is expensive. None of it has to do with a real connection to religion or ethnicity. It has a connection to dollars, Jeff Jorgensen says. Jorgensen runs Elemental Cremation and Burial, a green funeral home in Seattle and co-owns Clarity Funerals and Cremation. Traditions and religious practice are strong and will never really go away. But in some cases, cost wins out over tradition. Even deeply religious families who would normally abhor cremating their dead are opting for cremation in many cases, Jorgensen notes. It makes no sense to spend $14,000 to bury grandma when they can't pay for food. Too often, bereaved families scramble to cover costs for a memorial after a loved one unexpectedly passes away. Many families turn to online funding. GoFundMe proudly describes itself as the leading online funeral fundraiser with 125,000 plus campaigns raising $400 million a year. Other families aren't so lucky. Where I'm from here in California, what we see a lot are just people standing on the side of the road with a cardboard sign asking for money for a funeral, Chavez says, especially in poor rural communities. That is the norm. You see a lot of funeral car washes where families will stand outside gas stations, and what they're doing is they're raising money to pay for the funeral. Families don't know that they often have a choice. No one should have to pay that much. 100 years of tradition. Before 1861, burying the dead was a family affair. When someone died, usually at home, it was their family that washed and prepared them. The body would be laid out in the nicest room in the house and people would come and pay their respects. That practice, a simple practice, existed for generations until the Civil War and the beginnings of the modern American funeral industry. The almighty dollar has dictated our burial customs ever since. On May 24, 1861, Colonel Elmer Ellsworth became the first Union soldier killed in the Civil War. Due to the heat and distance, soldiers' remains often went through advanced stages of decomposition by the time they reached home. 
After hearing of his death, Dr. Thomas Holmes, the father of modern embalming, offered his services to the Ellsworth family. They accepted, and Colonel Ellsworth became the first Civil War soldier to be embalmed. Before long, it wasn't uncommon to see amateur undertakers set up shop on the outskirts of battlefields, ready to make good money embalming the dead. Competition was fierce, and the burgeoning industry was wholly unregulated. The years after World War II were another turning point for the American, uh, Great American Funeral. The economic boom of the 1950s meant people had more money than ever to flaunt. That didn't stop with the shiny Cadillac or television set. An extravagant funeral was just another way to show your wealth. Funeral trends were dictated heavily by Forest Lawn Cemetery and its general manager, Hubert Eaton. Eaton was the original upbeat undertaker, writes Caitlin Doty, co-owner of Clarity Funerals and Cremation with the Organson. In her memoir, Smoke It's In Your Eyes, he took the dull, sad funerals of yore and injected them with euphemisms. A person didn't die, they took their leave. Embalming fluid in bright pink satin lined caskets. In short, death in America has become a commodity. Our customs and traditions are dictated by industry rather than spirituality or values. Our fear of getting old and dying prevents us from talking about it, so we perpetuate the same customs, customs designed specifically for profit. Say you don't want to spend a turning in the cemetery in a mahogany coffin with wire holding your mouth closed. What do you do? My new thing is promoting micro-conversation, Jorgensen told me. Instead of this, I want to sit down and talk about my final arrangements, and all of a sudden it's this huge conversation. It's more saying, you know what? I think I want to be cremated, and that's it. Jorgensen, along with Doty, is one of the founding members of the Order of the Good Death. The group promotes books, holds events, and cultivates online communities designed to open up a dialogue about death and our relationship with it. Communication is probably the most important thing to come out of the death positive movement, Jeff Jorgensen. The death positive movement is sizable. The Order of the Good Death has 151,000 likes on Facebook, and Doty's YouTube Ask Mortician has 1 million subscribers and over 125 million views. Death positivity is growing, but the movement is still in the outreach phase, Executive Director Chavez says. Jorgensen says the movement has more of an academic appeal to young people who are yet to really experience death. What we need is the 35 to 50 year olds having death positive moments, and I think we're starting to see that. Shit gets real when a parent dies. It's no longer a fun yet gruesome intellectual exercise. It's your life. When you get older, you don't want to sit around talking about this because it's what you have to deal with. The future of funerals. So where do the experts see the industry going? There's a growing trend towards natural or green burials. A natural burial essentially returns a body to the earth with no chemicals, allowing it to decompose naturally with little damage to the surrounding environment. Traditional burials are chemical and resource heavy. The average cremation uses the same amount of energy and creates the same amount of carbon emissions as two tanks of gas. The heat from cremation also vaporizes tooth fillings, releasing mercury into the air. Natural burials, on the other hand, use very few resources. Natural burials, if desired, return much of the death care to the families. You take care of the body at home, you do the dressing and lay them out beautifully with flowers and invite people over and share food and memory, Chavez says. Of course, the simpler burial, the cheaper it is. You're not paying for embalming, you're not paying for a silk lined casket or a concrete vault. A do-it-yourself funeral may sound macabre and daunting, but Chavez says it could be a moving, empowering experience. So few of us have the experience of sitting with our dead and spending any time with them anymore, especially here in the U.S. We get them back after they've been embalmed and they're covered in all this makeup. We don't know what the dead look like anymore. Our experience of death and dead bodies are fictionalized, sensationalized, Chavez says. We did have one lady who just wanted to be in the ground, skin on dirt. Sarah Wambold. Sarah Wambold, a funeral director in Texas, has been working in the industry for about 15 years. She discovered green burials not long after getting her director's license. I just completely fell in love with the idea. I thought this was the next step. Wambold will soon open Campo de Estrellas, a conservation cemetery just out of Austin. Conservation burials like Campo de Estrellas or Field of Stars combine green burials with nature conservation. These burial grounds sell plots to people with the added bonus of protecting the surrounding environment. If an eternity's rest in nature isn't, uh, in a nature reserve isn't your thing, there are a few options. You can use a biodegradable container, which could be woven from willow or banana leaves. You can even get coffins made out of wool or cardboard if you wish. 
you can be laid to wrap, uh, rest wrapped in a simple shroud. We did have one lady who wanted to be just in the ground, skin on dirt. Ultimately, money will be the main deciding factor for many families. Inexpensive options may overtake traditional burials over the next two to five decades, Jorgensen predicts. He sees cremation, water cremation, and body composting, which reduces the body to soil in as little as 30 days as driving cheaper options. Body composting, for instance, costs families around $5,000. Jorgen believes the industry will change for the better by families knowing their options. The consumer gets to dictate what they want out of a funeral home. That's what I see changing, Jorgensen says. Once you crack that door, a lot of other funeral homes have to respond on some level. Look at attorneys or auto repair. Those are marks that have changed because consumers have said, F*** you. Because it's got the death label and there's fewer of us offering these services, there's been a slower change. Thanks to the work of advocates like those in the order of the good death, most people are taking part in these conversations and learning their options not only as consumers, but as future corpses. There's definitely been a boom in interest, Wambold says. I'm really hoping that younger generations are much more environmentally aware and invested, and they'll be a little more familiar with the environmental costs that traditional burial is taking and what these alternatives are. Before I wrapped up my chat with Chavez, I asked her how she'd like to be buried. She wants to be recomposed to honor the women who blazed a trail before her. I have pretty much on a daily basis that I don't care. I don't care what you do with my body. I will be dead. It matters. You do matter. Your death matters. You can choose something that will reflect the values and beliefs that you held in your life and translate them into death. What you choose to do is your final act, the final gesture on this earth. It does matter. This is the first in CNET's The Future of Funeral series. Stay tuned this week for more. Right. So, let's touch on a couple of things. The first thing I'm going to state is the title. Funerals are expensive, broken, and exploitative, and they have to change. The median cost is $7,360, and most in the U.S. can't afford it. That is the eye-catching information. Funerals are expensive, broken, and exploitative. They have to change. Body composting costs families around $5,000. I'm glad that body composting and green burials have solved the cost problem. So that's the first thing that upsets me with uh, articles like this, is these are not solutions to that problem. They're not even close to the solution to that problem. And you say, oh, well, you know, as more of these things become uh, more mainstream, the prices will go down. Possibly. You just said in the article that 30-something, 39% of Americans cannot afford an unexpected expense of more than $400. We're not talking about $500. We're not talking about six, seven, eight hundred, nine hundred, one thousand. dollars $900, $1,000. we are talking about $5,000 for composting. They can't afford that. If you can't afford a funeral, you can't afford composting. Um, so what is my beef? My beef is nothing is actually solved by this article. It bitches about the traditional mortuary situation, but actually doesn't offer anything. It is green burial, quote, end quote, propaganda. Um, quoting nothing but Jorgensen, Chavez, and Doty uh, with death positivity, et cetera, et cetera. It doesn't actually solve the problem of how do we fix this? So what we're saying is it's okay if they're expensive, just not exploitative and broken. Um, you know, I struggle to find the point. And it's articles like this that just drive me up the wall because if you're going to talk about costs, let's talk about costs and how we can drive costs down. So the first thing is we need to explore as an American culture saving our cash again. I can tell you personally, I have a horrible time hoarding money. Uh, probably the best thing that I have gotten out of this pandemic is how to save my money again like not have impulse buys and silliness. I have become extremely more conscientious about how much money I actually spent. So the first thing is Americans need to spend more time looking at their financial situations, especially when they're in poverty, and determining how much can I save? Where can I put this? Because for anyone decides to you know try to say, well, you don't understand, I work in Miami, Florida. Specifically, my campus that I teach at is in Opelika, Florida. The overwhelming majority of people who come to Miami-Dade College where I teach full-time are economically depressed. 
And in Miami, if you're not making seventy-five to eighty thousand dollars, you are not capable of living in Miami. Okay, eleven hundred square foot homes with mold will sell for three hundred thousand dollars. It is ridiculous down here. Trust me. We know about GoFundMe's, we know about fish fries, we know about t-shirt sales, we know about car washes, we know about Facebook funding, we know all about poor people needing money for funerals. So no one can tell me that we are not dealing with this here in Miami and doing it um, on, a, on a fairly regular basis. There are some absolute true statements in here. Okay, I'm not going to say Nicole is completely off of her cracker here. Um, the first thing is we are a youth-centric society. We purchase fast cars in order to uh, rebuild our machismos. We purchase Louis Vuitton handbags and shoes so we can show off. There are people that will show up in a $300 pair of sneakers but no textbooks going to school. Come on. Your priorities have to shift. That is an important change. Well, Professor Finn, you know, that's extremely inconsiderate. No, that is what people post on their social media here in Miami. You know, I have students who will come in. They don't have their textbooks, but they'll get pictures of themselves on Facebook with a new BMW that they just bought and they're paying $800 a month for. I'm glad you have the BMW. That mentality needs to change. Plain and simple. That mentality needs to change. Um, you are not Jeff Bezos. You're not Bill Gates. You cannot compete with them until you make your billions and then you can compete. Um, I won't qualify this as true or false, but I, I would be unsurprising if we were not the largest, if not one of the largest anti-aging markets in the world. Uh, and we do. We do, have, we do have a tendency to shuffle away our people to nursing homes and hospitals. Um, most deaths occur in a clinical setting. That is an undisputed fact. Um I do find fault with some of this garbage in here with this and the broken system. Um, one, it slams SCI. Not that SCI is deserving of a whole hell of a lot of praise, uh, but they are one of the most significant funeral employers in the uh, in the United States and arguably the world. Um, and they make a ridiculous amount of money. And there's no doubt that the larger the corporation, the more likely it is to be profit motivated and profit centered. Um, and I would probably say that of my colleagues who work in corporate environments, profit motivation is something that um, overwhelmingly they themselves do not fall into. Their corporate overlord might. The, the corporation is going to want to turn something to their uh, stock and stakeholders. But the individuals who go into funeral service don't generally go in there for greed motivation uh, purposes. So the idea that uh, it says, you know, it says here uh, they, they purchase these small family-owned funeral homes with no kidding. Duh. Um, you want a private viewing to say goodbye? That's seven hundred twenty-five. Embalming to uh, cosmetics four twenty-five for space and staff. That's a thousand bucks before the funeral even starts, which is usually included in the price of the funeral. Um, so a statement like that is extremely irresponsible. That's already there. That's part of the $7,000. Um, the other thing is the family firms do that too. Service corporation does not have the exclusive on a la carte. You go to the buffet and if it isn't all you can eat, you pay one fee, you pick whatever you want. You go to a Piccadilly or an old Western Sizzler. If those are still around, what you put on the plate is what you get charged for. Plain and simple. And funeral homes are businesses, and they do those same exact sort of things depending on their markets and their business models. Um, I just got an email from a woman, an older woman today, said that she buried her husband. The funeral home told her a lot of, they had put concrete over the casket. Um, okay, I'm not going to say that uh, typically older people uh, are told one thing and hear something else because I only deal with a 90 year old father who will tell me his version of events. I'll speak to a social worker or a nurse or someone else who give me their version of the events. And as a uh, video uh, YouTuber uh, lawyer from Canada, Viva Fry likes to say, there's story A, there's story B, and then the truth is somewhere in the middle, okay? So fact of the matter is, I take any sort of statement where someone says, oh, I was told this, if it's not in writing, it's liable to be construed as something else. I've had people accuse me of pulling casket swapperoos. 
I explained the casket wasn't there. I showed it to them on the Statement of Goods and Services. I even explained it and wrote it down in the other requirements section of the Statement of Goods and Services and still got accused of pulling a casket swaparoo after they signed it. And I know I explained it because that is my protocol when I am arranging funerals to explain every section of every document so that these sort of miscommunications do not occur. They're going through a grieving event. People do not hear things straight. Uh, it's a lie and you hear these lies a lot. Absolutely. There are some very unscrupulous individuals in the funeral business. Here in Florida, we have a problem with individuals who run funeral homes and are themselves not funeral directors and, unlike, and, cannot, and are not licensed to do the job. But you don't have to be licensed in Florida to own a funeral home. And some of these folks are doing very well for themselves. Some of them have never even seen the inside of a mortuary school. Um, so fact of the matter is, there's a lot of due diligence that consumers have to do. Go look at licenses, lots of things. So yes, people are going to lie because people suck. That is no different. Right now, I'm shopping for a home. Do you think I'm going to believe everything that every mortgage broker says? Oh, I, I can qualify you for half a million dollars. Oh, I'm sure you can. Oh, it'll be affordable for maybe the first three months. I mean, you have to do your due diligence here. So um, saying that, you know, funeral homes are commonly misrepresenting things to their clients. Again, this is propaganda bullshit. Um you had one bad call, and the people who called a bitch are the ones that had the bad experience. So when you are the customer service line, of course, that's all you're going to hear. Um, concrete blocks are not only profitable, but they make it easy to keep everything uniform so the lawn maintenance can be done around them. And the other part of that is because it keeps everything uniform, it reduces the liability of the cemetery so that there are not uneven spots in the ground when the landscaping is done so people don't twist their ankles and then sue the cemetery for half a million dollars because they stepped in a hole they didn't see because the grass is all, grass is all cut to the same level. So you cannot distill this by saying, oh, it's just a convenience factor because people like free lunches. I'm looking at you folks who walk into a Walmart in the middle of a monsoon, slip and bust your ass, and then sue Walmart for $300,000 because you didn't know it was a wet floor. So why do cemeteries charge people for things under the guise of law? I just discussed that. Uh, because cemeteries are by and large private properties. They can essentially make their own rules. Again, this is an oversimplification of the thing. Yes, they most certainly can. Here's a hint. You're welcome to go choose any cemetery you want within the price point that you wish to pay for. And if you don't wish to pay the price point, don't purchase cemetery property. Don't bitch about the cost of a Mercedes uh, if you want a Mercedes. Uh, of course, they're going to choose what is most profitable for them. And also to protect the fact that they are going to get sued because people have this assumption that funeral homes and cemeteries are cash cows, which is something that this article promotes, you know, $3.19 billion in SCI. Well, not everyone's an SCI cemetery or funeral home, man. Um, and they may not have the most uh, luxurious insurance policy to cover lawsuits for every person that wants to sue them for something free. Upsells like concrete vaults and embalming are so common, they're seen as requirements, and few are in position to question it, which is why we have the FTC funeral rule, which is why there are embalming disclosures required to be on statements of goods and services on all 50 states. It's why you should be discussing those when you are meeting with your clientele as to why there is a reason for embalming and why you have to state that on the statement of goods and services if you have to embalm so that there is no doubt why it is you are doing it. Uh, many funeral homes require bodies to be embalmed before viewing. Very true statement. And morticians are often taught in mortuary school it's a necessity. That's absolute bullshit. You tell me the school that is teaching their the, teaching their students, most called you children, the median ages in the mid twenties. Uh, you you find a mortuary school that tells its students that it's a necessity, and I can tell you you're not going to because they all pretty much use the same mortuary law textbook by Mr. Gilligan, who is the uh, head lawyer for the National Funeral Directors Association. And it very clearly states that embalming is not a necessity. Funeral homes may require it, but it is not a necessity. 
I mean, come on. There, there's just some absolute BS here, which is the usual crap that I see when people want to promote, quote unquote, the green burial alternative is cheaper, et cetera, which it is not that much cheaper. Uh, you know, 1700 bucks, 2300 bucks. Great. You just told me that most people can't afford more than a $400 uh, excess. Too much. It is too much. And, you know, why is there such a deviation in the different markets? I mean, here in Miami, you want, you want a cremation? Oh, we're not going to pay, we're not going to pay eighteen, nineteen hundred dollars like the rest of the country. Here in Miami, you're going to get a three ninety five special. Um, truth is embalming isn't required at all. No kidding. No state law requires everybody to be embalmed, which is why that's printed pretty much on every general price list as an embalming disclosure and on every statement of goods and services um, has a reason for embalming. There's a common belief that embalming is actually sanitizing the body, making it safe to be around. Yes, because it reduces liability. Once again, we are back to the free lunch law lawsuit. If someone walks in and gets the sniffles and says, I contracted COVID-19 because, oh, I didn't have a cold or a fever before the viewing, and now I do, they're going to sue the funeral home. So when we have established in our jurisprudence that this is one thing that keeps people safer, the answer to that is it's going to be hard to back off of that. That is just the truth of the matter. So it is not as simple as saying, oh, it's safe to be around. For you and your family, most certainly, especially if you're doing everything at home. But the first time someone walks into your home and gets sick and then they blame you for it and then engage you in a civil suit because of the injurious uh, nature of what happened to them for attending your home wake, here's a hint. These articles are going to change because now you have a whole new type of litigation. Uh, corpses pose no real threat to public health. That is an oversimplification as it has always been. It's usually based on the argument by, um, I think it's, they, they, they're quoting Dr. Lee or they're, token, or they're, they're talking about Dr. Uh, Baden, who said that there is no difference, you know, pathogenically between a live human person, a corpse, and basically a, uh, a handrail on a bus. The, the uh, handrail, the anatomy, on being most deadly because it is touched by much more people. Again, this is an oversimplification. Corpses themselves pose no real threat when they are disinfected and they are presented for funeralization and the body is disposed of in a quick fashion. If you're trying to tell me that that green marbleized mess uh, that was left out in the trailer for three weeks without air conditioning is not a pathogenic hazard. There's a reason why people get into PPEs to do those types of transfers uh, because there is a vermin situation. There are microbial situations. You can most certainly get sick. Uh, the pathogens that decompose uh, bodies aren't dangerous. Um, don't know if you've been paying attention in high school science class, but Escherichia coli is located in your intestines. When that translocates outside of your intestines because your body is breaking down, that means you have E. coli growing all over you. So if you're trying to tell me that E. coli is not dangerous for you, perhaps you haven't been paying attention to the FDA when they issue E. coli uh, warnings. Uh, corpses aren't dangerous. Does mounting... Uh, proof embalming fluid is. Now, no mounting proof, dangerous. It's a regulated substance. I mean, there is so much that I detest in this article that I really can't put it in words. It's just horrible. Uh, the main chemical in embalming fluid is formaldehyde. It is formaldehyde gas suspended in solution, typically formalin solution, which is incredibly toxic, especially if you drink it. Uh, it is not a cure for COVID-19. Since the 80s, studies some morticians are at greater risk of triple types of cancer because of their exposure to embalming fluid. Um, and a lot of that has to do because embalmers were not wearing proper uh, personal protection equipment. Uh, once bodies decompose, the embalming fluid seeps into the dirt, potentially contaminating ground. So this is one of those green burial talking points that I absolutely wreck every time I see this crap and every time someone babbles on like an infant about it. You cannot look me in the face and say embalming is on the decline. The direct cremation is on the uptick, that funerals are going away and embalming is not being used, and that this is still a massive threat to the world. 
Every metric reported by the National Funeral Directors Association shows that we are no longer having viewings, especially with the COVID-19 thing. Um, the, the chemical preservation is one of those things that most certainly has gone the way of the dodo bird uh, for most businesses. So as you have this decline, you cannot continue to talk about this is still a problem like it was in the 50s and 60s where 99% of all the bodies were buried and all of the bodies were buried without liners or vaults of some sort. So as the metal and wood caskets um, broke down, yes, the stuff would seep into the soil. The problem is formaldehyde gas nat occurs naturally and it's inactivated by very simple things in the environment. So it will regulate itself out at some point. When you have saturated soil like you have with uh, some of the old cemeteries, uh, even in Pinellas County, Florida, where I worked, there was uh, a, a massive cleanup at a cemetery because of all the old caskets. But again, 99% of bodies were being embalmed at that point. I don't know what the number is now, but it is not 99%. It's not 50%. I'm going to say it's around 30% of all bodies are being embalmed because there are so few people who are opting for a full funeral because of cost reasons. You know, no joke. Funeral homes are pricing themselves out of existence. But down here in Florida, I've seen the, you know, $2,900 full funeral viewing with next day service plus minimum casket. So again, you have to shop. Uh, the bigger danger to most Americans isn't the risk associated with embalming fluid. No kidding. It's the risk that a funeral could bankrupt them entirely in case the cancer treatment hasn't. Uh, absolutely. Preach that, sister. Preach that every day. But we have to explore the reasons as to why that is. It is not just a poverty issue. It is a social issue where people want to compete by showing wealth that they do not have. This is something that is essential almost in the American psyche. That needs to change, absolutely. Um, a study by the Federal Reserve. So th there's, you know, most people are an $80,000 funeral bill would be emotionally and financially devastating, let alone the $5,000 composting bill. Uh, so the problem is, is from that point on, after you say this, any alternative that is not less than $1,000 is immediately done. You say, oh, well, you know, it's easier to try to, you know, bankrupt yourself you're still going bankrupt, whether it's 8,000, 14,000, or 5,000. So my problem is there is no solution. There is no solution here. There's people uh, doing car washes, especially for young kids. Yeah, I get that. Dude, trust me. Trust me when I say I get that. That's why more often than not, which is not mentioned anywhere in this article, there are funeral homes out there, Service Corporation International Funeral Homes, being one of the prominent ones that offer significant discounts to certain age groups, especially children and maybe teenagers, because they know that families and people are not in the position to do those sort of things. Now, I can also tell you that SEI does not have a lot of ability to price negotiate. You go see an SEI counselor and they are stuck in a rather rigid system. You go to a family-owned funeral home and you can have some other discussions. Um, that's one of those things that you know you you have to engage in. A huge thing that is always omitted is how much it actually costs to run a damn funeral home. Um, you know they they're, they're quoting their funeral home uh, that's natural only. Well, you know well, how much are your operational costs? How many calls that you do? How much are you charging? Are you charging less than a thousand dollars? If not, then you fall into the same problem that everyone else is here. Um, One hundred years of tradition. So what's interesting is this tells me, this absolutely tells me that someone, uh, either the author of this article or one of the people they interview, which is not surprising because if Caitlin Doty went to the Cypress College in California, that means she is a graduate of a program where I have a very good friend teaching. Um, they use the History of American Funeral Directing, which is the common textbook for history, where oh, this is almost taken as direct quotes out of. So something omitted, Term Colonel Elmer Ellsworth, isn't just a first union soldier. He's an officer that was a close friend of Abraham Lincoln. And then when Abraham Lincoln saw the results of Dr. Thomas Holmes, this put embalming on the radar because then everyone in DC had to do it. And then when everyone saw the embalming of President Lincoln, it started this firestorm. And we see this going back in history. We saw that when a Pope's friend, one of the empresses died, 
he draped the entire cathedral in black cloth. And what happened? Everyone started draping it. This is what funerals have been and why sumptuary laws uh, have come and gone literally throughout the centuries. It has always been a market-driven thing. Um, before long, it wasn't common to see amateur and bombers set up shop on the outskirts of battlefields. Yes, because people were now aware of this new technology and they wanted their people back. Um, what they were guaranteeing essentially is that if your son, your brother, your uncle, your father, your husband dies, we will bring them back to you, which is Something very important at that time because it wasn't until the American Civil War that we even had rules for setting up graveyards. Um, th that's one of those orders that came in during the U.S. Civil War is that the U.S. Department of uh, – I think the Army stated that at every major battlefield, land has to be set up uh, adjacent to the battlefield in order to bury the dead so that if someone wants to later on, they can be collected rather than just leave them out in a mass pit. Um, so there is so much that is just not here because, again, it is a complex issue. And these early embalmers, some of them were scumbags, absolute scumbags. Uh, it's a completely unregulated industry, which is why we started an associational push, which is why we created what was the precursor of the National Funeral Directors Association. And the NFDA has – become the de facto kind of spokesperson and lobbyist group for funeral directors literally since post-Civil War. Um, the organization has been essential to the growth of funeral directors in um, in the United States with committees of then the NFDA later on becoming the International Conference of Funeral Service Examining Boards, which is the board exam, folks, as well as the American Board of Funeral Service Education, which created and stand or basically standardized the curriculum so that the schools will all be teaching something similar, guaranteeing that graduates all have the same type of competencies to at least some certain level. Um, of course, 1950s, everyone had to show off. Um, I didn't even know about Hubert Eaton, so you know, good for him. Um, I took the Del Sad funeral, and, and we see that movement today: funerals being personalized, uh, funerals being you know an uplifting event. It's not death, doom, and gloom. And we saw that in the Civil War. That towards the end of the Civil War, towards the end of the 1800s, that the doom and gloom of the Victorian area was completely obliterated by the new funeral. Uh, with uh, you know, promise. We we see a transition of dark colors uh, building way into flowers. Flowers were never a thing until the late 1800s, uh, and that became entrenched in uh, U.S. mortuary uh, behaviors. Um, in short, death Mary has become a commodity, um, not in any less than it has ever been. Period. Our customs and traditions are dictated by industry rather than spirituality or values, and I completely disagree with that. All too often, people actually come in and sit down with the funeral director, this funeral director talking, and tell me, you know, this is the way it has to be because this is the way we do it. And you cannot explain to them otherwise. So there are just as many people out there who are coming in when you try to educate them and say, well, that's just tough crap. We're not going to do it that way um, and shooting you down. So, um, you know, I can speak to the other side of that where a person clearly cannot afford an eight or nine thousand dollar bill. And they will not in any way, shape, or form be steered otherwise, and not because of any other reason than that's what they want. And the problem there is then do I walk a call? Then do I say, well, no, I'm just not going to serve you because you know, uh, you're know you you're doing a, a greater disservice to yourself. They're going to find someone to sell them their product. That's the unfortunate truth. Uh, our fear of getting old and dying prevents us from talking about it, so we perpetuate the same customs, customs designed specifically for profit. That's a crap. That is an absolute shit statement. These are not customs designed specifically for, for profit. These are customs that evolved as a result of a great many factors which have developed into a system that people did take advantage of. And that for the last several years, especially the last maybe decade plus, Funeral directors have been trying to push in a different direction, creating funerals that have meaningful relationships to the families. You know, when we talk about profit, how about the golf clubs and the hotels? They'll say, have your memorial here. Look at everything that we have the offer. That's crap specifically designed for profit. I don't see any of that up here. 
Talk about the hotels. Talk about the golf clubs. Talk about the the the, the um, catering halls. Talk about people going right to church. Say, hey, you know, you need to use us over here because we're much cheaper than funerals, and we'll give you a better deal. That's profit. That's profit. So when you say that funeral directors are the only people trying to suck the life out of the American consumer, no, honey, that's called capitalism. Okay, and, and it is extremely hard. Uh, to maintain a funeral business when you are literally now competing with places like the Ramada, the Hilton, and golf courses, which offer much more comprehensive catering services and full liquor bars, because apparently that's what people want at funerals these days, uh, at a fraction of what you may have to charge for something like that because your funeral home was never designed for it. And guess what? Your costs don't go down. So as you lose additional revenue streams, you have problems and you don't stay in business. So the good news is your home burial movement might be closer than you think. So why funeral homes are closing down. People don't want to run them. People don't want the stress and they're going to disappear. Uh, say you don't want to spend attorney in a cemetery or having your wife, why are holding your mouth closed? That's cute. That's real cute. I see what you did there. It's not just wire. Use needle and thread as well. Uh, you know, cover all aspects of it. Uh, the new thing is promoting micro conversations. So if I want to sit down and talk about my final range, when all of a sudden it's this huge conversation, it's more saying, you know, what I think I want to be, and that's it. That's not enough. And that's dangerous. That is extremely dangerous because, oh, well, you know, dad said he wanted to be created. Dad can change his mind. So again, now, now we go back to litigation factory, go about, you know, contracting. We go, the, 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 this is such an oversimplification. Yes, it's nice to know which, which way and which route you want to go, but you have to absolutely have the huge conversation. Uh, you start with something like this. You start with something like this, and then you need to start having honest conversations. People need to realize you're going to die. COVID-19 is helping you out with that. Uh, whether it's a perceived real threat against the uh, persistence of humanity or whether it's a fake uh, situation is irrelevant. Fact of the matter is people are staring at it. People now recognize that they can die at any time. That's going to help these conversations. Um, it, it's amazing how all the experts in this all belong to the same group. They all belong to the same ethos. They all literally are the same side of the argument. Um, stuff like this really upsets me because there is not enough here. It says, you know, the Order of the Good Death has 151,000 likes on Facebook. Great. And there's no doubt that Miss Doty is a social media influencer. There is no doubt about that. Um, and the death positivity movement is something that we deal with in the classroom here. And, you know, I have students that are, are fully entrenched into this. Uh, and those students will happily tell you that we are not telling them that embalming is absolutely mandatory and required and they need to do it. There are reasons why you do it. There's reasons why you don't do it. And there are very many ways, as any student of mine will attest to you, that you can present the body in a natural form without embalming uh, for meaningful funeralization. This is what educators do. Um we need is 35 to 50 year olds having death positive moments. And I think we're starting to see that. What you need to have is 35 to 50 year olds having death moments in general. And that's part of the problem is they're not having death moments prior to that age. I had a 56 year old uh, and a 54 year old couple, uh, first death in their family ever. And they had no idea what they were doing. They're almost 60. That's a problem. Okay. That is, that, that is something as a result of our new longevity. Um, there's a growing trend towards natural or green burials. It's a very small percentage. It is a very small percentage. Um, a natural burial essentially returns the body to the earth. No chemicals on it decompose naturally. Little damage to the surrounding environment. Simplification, but go to greenburialcouncil.org and they will happily explain the options. Um, chemical and resource heavy. Uh, remember, it, when we talk about resources, that includes the, the little caterpillar that digs the grave. If not, and you're doing this, you're digging it by hand. You're paying cost per hour for that. Again, it is not cheap. It is not cheap. The primary argument for this whole article is funerals aren't cheap. And these natural burials also are not cheap. They are much more affordable uh, in some cases. I've seen people charging like $3,000 from start to finish for one of these, but it's still $3,000. Um, simpler of burial the cheaper it is no no don't even start that shit with me please 
don't even start it with me. That is not a true statement. There is no correlation with that. You can have something that is very simple. It is also very expensive. Uh, and part of the charm here is the fact that what a Caterpillar does with a couple scoops of the fork on the front, two guys in a shovel are going to take several hours to do it and put it all back later. So whether you are paying for the Caterpillar and the expulsion of... Um, fossil fuel fumes into the environment, or whether you're having two or three guys huffing it, that's an important uh, important consideration. You're paying for, you're going to be paying for labor. You're not paying for embalming, but you're paying for the ditch digger. You most certainly are. You're paying for the grave digger 100% of the time. Um, again, these are the same talking points I always see people make uh, from a one side perspective. You're not getting a full picture. Um, and absolutely, Chavez is right. You know, I, people need to be involved with death and being involved with that funeralization is, uh, is an extremely healing process, but it's also very dangerous. And I can speak to that because when my mom passed away, the funeral home I worked for performed the cremation because they were up in Pinellas County and I lived in Miami-Dade, but I'm the one that arranged for the memorial. I'm the one that cantered the mass. I'm the one that was very active with the entire actual funeral. And I can tell you, I don't remember anything about that time because it was a whirlwind. So I had no time to grieve. Um, so you definitely want to have many hands and disseminate things. If not, there may be some there may be some issues that come out of that, which needs to be discussed. That it's not just about being macabre and daunting. It is certainly daunting, and it certainly helps when there's people like Ms. Chavez, Ms. Doty, Mr. Jorgensen, uh, to help you out and kind of guide you through the process. But you are saving a considerable amount of money because the professional's not involved. Um, you know, one thing that I, I didn't comment up here is that um, when they talked about people dying at home and uh, the home death movement, this is how funeral parlors came into existence. <laughs> I, I mean, that's that that that's that that's the audacity of this. It completely doesn't even address that. That they put them in the best room of the house. Yes. Then they started putting him in the best room in the best house in the town, and they started paying a gratuity to the homeowner. We know this because it's the same book that you pulled the, cur the Colonel Elmer Ellsworth from. And then people are like, well, heck, I can just build a dedicated facility that's completely custom to this type of experience so that – it's not a real residence, but it is a residence in which we display our dead. And then we have the birth of the American funeral home. Um, don't believe me, pick up the damn book and read it. Uh, so it's it's one of these, you know, talk about that. Put that in here as well. Um, and, we, you know, all the conservation burials, not cheap, still a couple thousand bucks. And you said people can't afford more than 400. Um Composting five grand. I've already beaten that to death. I'm not going to beat it to death anymore. Um, <sighs> she's not wrong. It matters. Your death matters. Coming to the realization that you are going to die matters. Having authentic conversation with your loved ones matters. And if you don't want to have the conversation with others, put these things down in writing. Give people guidance. When you choose to do uh, what you choose to do is your final act, your final gesture on earth, and there is nothing more caring than outlining what you want and providing guidance. It does not matter whether I agree with any of the individual in this article or not. People need to have authentic conversation about this. Now, I probably, without any doubt, am going to destroy every article they publish. There are so many points that I have brought up where the traditional funeral is on the decline. It has been for years. Uh, we are going to memorials. We're going to things after the body uh, is disposed of in the form of cremation. So many changes that are never addressed uh, by anyone when they write stuff like this. So this is Professor Finn signing off. We will see you next video. All my memories gather round her. Miner's lady, stranger.
stranger to the water, dark and dusty, painted on the sky, misty taste of moonshine, teardrop in my eye, country roads, take me home to the place I belong, West Virginia. Mountain Mama, take me home, country home.